Live from the Talking Joe Studios. It's Talking Joe. Talking Joe Weekly Podcast. Talking Joe is there. Talking Joe thought we would last. Talking Joe is there. Find each other like a marriage vest. Talking Joe is there. Talking Joe is the code name for a completely untrained special podcast force. Its purpose, to produce a regular comic review show while breaking and replacing a series of presenters from across the world. Talking Joe. Talking Joe is there. Talking Joe. We are on our soapbox. Nobody seems to care. Fighting for fandom wherever there's trouble, the podcast on the air. Talking Joe is there. Talking Joe. Talking Joe. Talking Joe is on the air. Hey, 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 nonny, nonny. It is me, Mark, and welcome to Talking Joe, the best and longest running dedicated G.I. Joe comics podcast. If you are new to the show, you can find out all the details over at the website talkingjoe.co.uk. And while you're there, why not follow the links and give us some nice reviews? Or, you know, if you've never reached out to us before, drop me an email. Say, you you know, listening, enjoying the show. Um, that that is precisely what you've got to email by the, by the way. I don't really want anything deviating from that too much. And uh, we've also got a Facebook group, so join in on the fun over there. But social media distractions aside, today we will be looking at GI Joe issue two eight five, and there is someone who is going to be doing it with me. It is the Ronnie Barker to my Ronnie Corbett. It's my co-host, a real American Tim. It's Tim Finn. Hello, Mark, and hello, listeners. Woo, woo, woo! Uh, good to uh, have you back down the virtual line. Tim, feels like uh, ages, probably because it has been ages. Uh, yes, for those of you <laughs> listening t- to the show uh, sort of in at, at release date, uh, there, were, there were some weeks without an issue, or uh, someone was traveling, or... Uh, uh, but uh, it, it has felt like a, a long time. But I'm sitting in front of uh, G.I. Joe, A Real American Hero, 285 A cover, B cover, and retailer incentive. And I have my wow. my clipboard <laughs> with, uh, with sparse notes. The from... checklist. Is it good? Tick yes or no. Uh, uh, and I'm ready, to, I'm ready to talk about this comic. First, I, I have to just exclaim to the world, because this is one of the places I was looking forward to doing it. When last I spoke into this microphone for Talking Joe, my store, Hub Comics, in Somerville, Massachusetts, uh, near Boston, was still closed for renovations. We have reopened. We're back to seven days a week. Uh, Things are normal. It's great. Uh, We still have a couple rolling changes for uh, the fall. Uh, So in my mind, the renovation is, you know, 92% done. But as far as customers coming in and buying things, uh, it's done. It's great. Come see us, Hub Comics in Somerville, hubcomics.com, also Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Let's talk about G.I. Joe. Well, excellent. Hub Comics, I was so excited. I went out and made a a jingle for you, Tim. So um, (laughs) it is as good a time as any to play, I think. All right. Hub Comics! Your local comic store. Hub Comics! In Boston to explore. Hub Comics! Your local comic store. Hub Comics! Comics and much more. Hub Comics in Somerville near Boston. Check out hubcomics.com for details. Hub Comics! So there you go. That was a thing. <laughs> uh, and uh, and there's uh, there's uh, for those of you watching this, there there's uh, some light imagery involved in the video version of this of this hub comics jingle as well. For those of you only listening, you're missing a tiny little bit extra. 
<laughs> and uh, and so you had your soft reopening uh, for free comics books day. Does that mean that there's a a hard reopening to to come? No, that that already happened. That happened. You had a hard reopen. <laughs> uh, yeah. What was it? It was Monday. The yeah, we've been open for uh, a week and a half now. And and did did what was involved in the official reopening as opposed to the the soft one? Uh, a a piece of paper from the city that made the f- finishing of some municipal paperwork official. There we go. Pro pro pro. Ah. In England, it would have been a ribbon. Snip. Uh, there is a photo actually. Uh, so <laughs> um, uh, so I I I took over. I bought Hub Comics in 2011, but the store opened in 2008, and there actually is a photo from early 2008 with the then owner founder of the store two people i don't know and his manager my manager and the mayor of somerville cutting a ribbon um, in fact that photo this photo it's in a little frame used to hang on the wall behind the register so customers could see it uh, and it's been uh, in a box uh, at my home for the last year and a half and i was just thinking a couple days ago i should should put that back up behind the register area for people to see but i also need to get a, a uh, a letter board or a cork board or some movable shelving for that wall behind the register uh, so that we can, you know, put up like uh, $50 back issues or, you know, like our pick of the week or some random action figure if we happen to have an action figure for sale because we don't really carry action figures. So before I put a, a small photo in a small frame uh, on that wall, I need to, this this is one of those rolling changes I was talking about. Mm-hmm. Um uh, there's some there's some high space uh, high up on the on the walls where we can have some art. Uh, so I want to figure out what art's going to go there in the store. Uh, we're waiting for um, an upholstered bench or two where we used to have couches. We're waiting for uh, two small tables that you would see at a bookstore or a library to come in. Those are coming in in October. Um, but. Uh, Yes, soft opening, free comic book day, hard opening, which I was, which I called the grand reopening. But um, <laughs> you know, we, everyone's wearing masks. We didn't have food yeah. or drink, um, so it, it wasn't sort of the party that I was hoping it might be. But mm. considering how the pandemic's going, the fact that we were open and lots of people came in was a major victory. Yes. Um, so now uh, I've got to do some major remediation because uh, on the last uh, ARA issue when we were talking about two eight five. I missed a an I spy and uh, and Diana Davis pulled me up on my egregious I missed I guess you would call it if the opposite of I I spy um, the pizza place that uh, Al Calbra frequented was called Vaffa Napoli which uh, literally translated means go to Naples uh, and I you know, I knew enough to know that and I thought maybe that's a thing uh, but I didn't bother to, to actually double check and I missed out that the slang meaning is Italian for go to hell. <laughs> While we're correcting ourselves from previous episodes, um, uh, in a previous episode, we when we were interviewing one of our wonderful guests about their art collection, uh, we were referring to the original artwork to issue number 36, which is the Michael Golden painted cover with the Rattler, the Asp, and the mm-hmm. hovercraft and our guest was sort of recalling that uh this issue had been advertised on television and it was not and mm-hmm. uh a couple times uh doing the dishes since then i've thought oh wait wait we got that fact got that fact wrong i should i should fix that in a future episode uh but let's talk about uh gi joe 285 comic talk oh comic talk Larry Hammer writes them, Tim and Mark discuss them, whoa. Comic talk, oh, comic talk. Larry Hammer writes them, Tim and Mark discuss them, whoa. Okay, so uh, G.I. Joe 285 released uh, 11th of August 2021, which is this year as we speak. Writer, Larry Hammer, artist, Andrew Lee Griffiths, with no S, uh, Colour, Jay Brown. Letters, Neil Utaki. Senior editor, Tom Waltz. Editor, Megan Brown. Research specialist, Diana Davis. So uh, this is part five of Murder by Assassination that we are on. And uh, let's start by looking at the covers. 
Let's have a look at the covers in the gallery. Cover A uh, is uh, the, um, the, the iconic six or seven Joes uh, with a flag motif uh, and a flag. Uh, just a just a, a a pose for us. This this calls uh, to mind uh, sort of the covers to Yearbook One and Two. If they had a baby, uh, <laughs> or maybe maybe I should say this also sort of calls to mind uh, uh, Nitho Diaz's uh, cover for uh, the reprint of Yearbook One. Anyway, mm-hmm. um, and also the uh, the back cover to Yearbook Number Two which uh, features the October Guard in quite a similar place. Oh, yeah, yeah. So where you have Flint uh, kneeling uh, with Lady J on his right, you have uh, one of the October Guard kneeling with uh, Dana. uh, Yeah, good point. So um, uh, Griffith does something subtle here. He's put the camera at about three feet. Uh, the camera's at about waist height. We're looking slightly up at Beachhead and Roadblock and Duke. And we're actually looking straight on at Flint and Lady J. So there's a little bit of a sense of power added to this uh, because of that um, because of that uh, simple choice. Um, I don't love the coloring. It's to sound like a, a broken record. Uh, you know, uh, Brown, J. Brown does a lot of... Uh, gradients and light sources that uh, I find inconsistent and confusing. Like, I don't, I don't know what the highlight on Duke's pants represent. And, you know, I don't know what this sort of purple reflected light on the right side of Roadblock's head is. Um, but uh, it's a fun cover. Um, the thing actually that jumps out, the two things that jump out the most to me about this cover. One, the logo is smaller than normal so that it doesn't, I think, crop the two Sky Strikers at the top. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. There's a lot more space on the, on the left. Uh, and if, you, if you're sitting, if you're looking at covers A and B and RI together, it's really clear. This, this logo is like 20 or 30% smaller. Um, and uh, number two, it does not say murder by assassination at the bottom. Mm. And... Uh, Until Tales and uh, the Cobra's Venom and Murder by Assassination, these these story arcs or these umbrella titles from the last couple of years, on the A covers, they're always there. And, uh, you know, this could be just a small oversight. I, d- I don't mind. I'm not confused or offended. But I do feel like it's symbolic considering that um, this doesn't feel like part five of five. It just feels like part five. And we have lost the thread of the murder by the assassination, uh, the, the mm. titular murder by the titular uh, assassination. <laughs> um, and then, you know, the last couple of covers have been um, so keen on putting Sherlock in the action. Uh, I'm, I'm a little disappointed that Sherlock isn't on this cover for two reasons. One, y- you know, it's, it's a spotlight for her and some new characters, and we've been seeing her on covers and two, more subtly, if you do this kind of um, iconic or like hoping this will become an iconic G.I. Joe cover, you know, like the most popular Joes, uh, one or two key vehicles, a flag, a flag motif, um, and it's just sort of a, a, you know, a poster image. If you're going to do this with Snake Eyes and Duke and, and Scarlet, why not how much power there would be in putting Sherlock into Mm -hmm. this drawing right like take beachhead out or uh lady j and put sherlock in and uh but you know we've talked to artists about how far ahead of time they're doing covers um and it's it's very possible that even you know from a year ago the the scheduling nightmare that was the spring and summer of 2020 for artists publishers you know licensors printers uh distributors that you know even even figuring out the cover for this issue sort of when they needed to uh called for um more than normal not quite knowing what the issue would be called for uh sort of either whatever whatever image was on hand or a a generic image sure um cover b 
is uh, the fifth of five interlocking covers drawn by Freddie Williams II and colored by Andrew Delhouse. And I think, I think even more than the last four, I'm really aware of this cover that really is screaming to be seen in a horizontal image with its four counterparts and mm -hmm. seeing it all by itself. It, you know, it's, it's a good drawing. It's not a great composition and it's not at all a satisfying cover, right? It's cool to see Gung Ho punching a Cobra soldier, but there's this very strange abstract shape just to the left of his fist, which sort of now I can see is a bat who's half cropped out because, you know, yep. there's a division. And then, you know, you have all this, I, I've said this in a previous episode, you have all this negative space because this was drawn as, as a, as a five images together. Uh, and if you were to just make a cover on its own of these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten characters, you would compose it very differently. Yep. Indeed. Um, also, the Crimson Guardsman is really beefed up. And, <laughs> and he's flying through the air like a ninja. Uh, and uh, Chuckles is wearing shorts, which I, which I kind of like. He's got <laughs> what looks like an Uzi. Uh, who's under Storm Shadow? Well, yeah, I was about to ask you the same thing. The, the, it, looks like, it looks like maybe the guy's horror show. I thought it was Mutt. Ooh, could be. Who's the lady? The lady. Hmm. So I can't tell if the costume I is supposed tell. to be uh, gray or black and sort of atmospherically to like push her back. It's colored as sort of a, a gray purple. Um, but she has dark hair and she's, it sort of looks like the Baroness. Is, no, the Baroness's weapon. Yeah, skin color unclear. I can't quite tell who um, that is. Yeah. Don't know, don't know, um, really don't know. So that's a, uh, that's a fun puzzle. You know, I, I think, I think as a general rule, uh, you know, with a with a with characters as clearly delineated, uh, we should know who this is. The person should be a little closer or have um, something more carefully drawn or colored about her, so we know uh, exactly who it is. I, I sort of wonder if it's. Um, she's not quite wearing boots. She looks sort of like she's wearing like scuba. Her, you know, her feet look sort of, mm -hmm. but then I'm thinking, well, maybe she's under storm shadow. Maybe it's a ninja. And I don't have the other four covers in front of me. Maybe it's uh, Jinx. I don't know. And the alley viper is missing. It's blue urban camo. Yeah. Alley right, viper is paired right back to the orange, really. Yeah. So, um, not, uh, this cover doesn't, this cover doesn't do much for me. I like the ingredients. I don't like how it's, I don't like how it all comes together. Retailer incentive cover is drawn by Julie Anderson. And uh, maybe uh, maybe my co-host can figure out who Julie Anderson is while I, while I talk about this <laughs> cover. So um, this is a, uh, this is just a, a single shot of Sherlock who is uh, knee deep in a swamp and there's a uh, can't quite tell what it is behind her on the right looks sort of like a like a hut made out of thatched grass or reeds um, looks a little bit like smoke like a giant giant like bale of hay but based on context I think it's some kind of like the side of a, of a house or a hut uh, there's a really bright white line which separates Sherlock on the left from the background, which I think is um, is overdone. And uh, and I think about this a lot in comics when you have a character um, or an object that's black, right? It, you know, it could just be um, something in shadow, or it could be Spider-Man in his black costume, and you have them against something that is black, like a shadow or the night sky. Do you ink the black all the way to the black, or uh, this comes up a lot in Batman comics. Or do you leave a thin sort of halo around them? And if you leave a thin halo, does the colorist then color that in uh, some a green color, something neutral like gray, or leave it uh, stark white? And I think the white is a little um, too much here. I like this cover, but um, Sherlock's eyes aren't quite focused on anything in particular. She looks um, like she's sort of staring like 
seven feet diagonally down in front of her, like not at her gun, not at someone she might be drawing her gun on, not at us. Uh, so if I could change one little thing about this cover, it would be um, how her eyes are focusing. Uh, but Julie Anderson, uh, not someone who has drawn uh, G.I. Joe covers before. Mark? Yeah, I'm assuming that she is Julie M. Anderson, uh, Art of Julie A. on Twitter. Julie Anderson showcases diversity in uncommon themes that emphasize strong women in fantasy and sci-fi settings. Uh, inspirations from childhood can be seen in her art via a fusion of Japanese and Afro-American themes that she persistently uses today. Um, so presumably, I think, a relatively new artist uh, and selected, I guess, for the, uh, you know, to, to, to highlight this uh, new character, Sherlock. I'm, I'm looking at what I think is... Uh... Julie M. Anderson dot Weebly dot com mm -hmm. uh, at the portfolio here. And I think this is the same artist and it's uh, I'm not seeing um, sequential comics work uh, or covers. Uh, I'm seeing uh, illustration and pinups. So I wonder mm -hmm. if this is Julie Anderson's first comics work. Could could well be. Uh, um, actually, you know what? I'm going to say definitively this is that person because, well, I'm looking at the signature on the cover and the signature on the website and they look uh -huh pretty similar anyway yeah i, I think so it's chiming in with with you sort of not 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 really for me this this one um yeah looks uh you know like a a first pass <laughs> to be honest there's a lot of uh there's a lot being lost in the in the contrasting colors that sort of the dark of the water versus the the you know the the very dark shading of the the left hand side of the the costume the sort of big striking kind of i don't know thatched building whatever it is that it's not really clear what it is and it's sort of uh losing a lot on the the right hand side uh, you know very strong highlights around most of the objects all coming together it's mm, yeah I, I i don't think it's necessarily uh necessarily my favorite i think this is one of those covers where uh it looks better on the monitor where it was colored and I think it was colored with monitors in mind. And when it gets printed, um, the colors get a little muddy. Uh, I think this was colored a little too dark for, for print. Um, Sherlock does, she does, you know, pop out, but not very much. Mm. Right. So with the covers all thoroughly looked at, uh, let's get on to a plot breakdown and find out what happens inside. In the jungle of Mara Wapor in Southeast Asia, the G.I. Joe team of Muskrat, Falcon, Wetsuit, Multo, Sherlock, Rock and Roll, and Recoil are on the tail of Al Cowbra, who is holed up in a former industrial park. The site looks quiet, almost too quiet. As the Joes make their move, they are shot at from the towers. A ferret and a stinger launch an attack also. They discover that the Cobra troops are bats, and so they didn't give off heat signatures. The bats, led by Overkill, are overwhelmed by the Joes. Overkill makes his escape in an Aspid with a container full of specialised construction bats. Meanwhile, Sherlock stops Al Cobra's escape and unmasks him to reveal that he has the face of a Fred series Crimson Guard. In the punch-up, Sherlock catches his fist in her robotic hand and crushes it. We are left with the mystery as to exactly what the Cobra Conspiracy was all about. So, talking points. Uh, Tim, do you want to start? Sure. I love the opening scene because it feels uh, quintessentially G.I. Joe. It feels like, mm -hmm. you know, the flashbacks to the uh, Long Range Reconnaissance Patrol group in vietnam it feels Absolutely. like an issue of special missions we've got you know seven joes almost all in green in the jungle uh doing you know soldier in the jungle kind of things mm -hmm. and uh and they come across a a building and they have to go in and then there's a fight so that's that's very exciting it's also great to see some characters we haven't seen in a long time um 
you know, I, I couldn't tell you when Recoil has had dialogue uh, <laughs> in an issue of G.I. Joe. Infrequently, yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, Wetsuit is in a costume that makes sense for him. Um, and, you know, it's always fun to see a mixture of old and new, you know, rock and roll from year one, but also Sherlock from year three. 39 <laughs> um and you know some joes in the middle you know falcon and and such um uh, i like this little bit of tech that they have in this opening scene which is uh something like a, a, a tablet um, hmm. um and uh um i love that there are some old vehicles you know a stinger and a ferret and and that they get used uh, specifically, you know, like we need one of them to fire missiles, Stinger, and you know, clearly the ferret's going to be able to do some, um, some, some terrain, some driving over terrain. Um, I was a little confused why the Joes. Maybe I'm over over reading into this, but the Joes seemed surprised that there were bats in this base, yep. and you know, if I was <laughs> if I was a Joe, you know, it's like. A third of the time, it's going to be bats. I mean, <laughs> Larry Hama has not used bats a lot in the comic, whereas if you watch the cartoon, you know, like in season two in 1986, the bats are in like every episode, you know, to the, to the point where you start to wonder why they even need Cobra soldiers and regular vipers. Um, they have been so, they have been a lot in the comics uh, during this this latter run. Well, I mean, across across Hammer's run, I'd I'd say, but was okay. more more towards. The back end of this, that the not too long ago there was a massive factory of uh, of bats that were found in, is I think I want to say Darklonia. Okay, right. Uh, thank by, you. By um, bomb bomb strike and uh, and and co. Um, and and before that, there was there was also um, Black Major and Red Laser uh, were overseeing a big bat sort of production okay. as as well. So uh, I think bats ha- have you know have have very much been around as a as a big cobra presence so so yeah to you know if there's cobra to 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 find bats shouldn't be too much of a surprise yeah Yeah. so uh you know at the bottom of page five the garage door opens up the joes are taking fire a stinger and a ferret drive out at us with several silhouetted characters on it Mm -hmm. and i thought oh those are probably bats i mean what what i really thought was oh Whoever this is, I'm not supposed to find out until the next page. This is supposed to be some kind of surprise mm-hmm. for the Joes, for me, the reader, or both. You know, it's going to be like Blue Ninjas or like Dreadnoughts that we weren't expecting or the Black Major or Firefly and some Ninjas or Bats or like brainwashed civilians. Like whatever it was, whatever it's going to be, it's going to be a surprise. But since there hadn't been heat signatures, I thought, oh, it's probably Bats. I like the f- the fight is great in this issue, um, and and the that some of it's very close. You know, they're like the bats are within five feet of them as they're mm-hmm. shooting them point blank, taking cover right behind these two Cobra vehicles. Um, you know, there's there's up and down. I mean, literally up and down because there's helicopters and there there are missiles fired and someone jumps off a helicopter. You know, there's there's good um, kinetic action in this issue of this action comic. Uh, and then we get the reveal of who Al Calbra is. So overall, I am uh, I was a little thrown when we got to the final page and there wasn't the closure that I thought we would, mm-hmm. we, we would have. And again, I thought, okay, well, Larry Hama writes this comic uh, for the first 155 issues and for the next 150 issues you know, one page at a time. He doesn't plot ahead of time and he doesn't know how an issue is going to end as he's writing pages one and two and three. Um, And so, you know, whether it's his idea or the editor's idea to have a five part story, there's a good chance that part five is not going to have the wrap up that one might expect from a five part story. Mm -hmm. Um, It says to be continued at the very end and rather than be uh, disappointed Right. It's like, I know these are the rules of this comic going in, you know, it's like, it's like reading Uncanny X-Men in the 1980s. It is an ongoing soap opera. And, you know, some plot threads are going to, you know, Colossus is going to disappear into the Siege Perilous and we're not going to see him for a year or two. 
that it's it's yeah it's five it's you know part five of a, an arbitrary part five parter that was decided up front but it's also issued 285 of an ongoing series where it's being made up as it goes along and yeah i mean we've got a tiny bit of closure in terms of the sort of face being revealed and and, uh, and sherlock getting getting to punch the guy yeah sherlock gets to to punch the guy that blew off her her arm in part part one so sort of a tiny bit of closure on on that part but the the ongoing story continues and and a new sort of mystery is uh kind of opened for for us but and as as we brought up uh, with part mm, two or three or four, right? Writer Larry Hama posted back in January of 2021 that uh, he was changing the story based on what actually happened in the U.S. Capitol in on January 6th, because there was a scene in this story that takes place in the Capitol, and. Uh, and I, I have wondered ever since that foiled assassination attempt uh, in, was it part three? I can't remember. Part uh, two. two. Yeah. Part two. Um, how much did that change that chapter? And then how much does that change everything that comes after? Mm-hmm. And then again, like, like, I can't say this clearly enough. Like, whether it was editor Tom Waltz's idea or Hama's idea to have a five-part story called Murder by Assassination... Larry Hama probably didn't know when he was writing chapters one and two and three if the assass- if if indeed the assassination wasn't something that ha- was supposed to happen in chapter two and then got changed because of real world news events. Um, Larry might have been like banking on his ability to come up with a murder <laughs> by assassination in chapter four or five, and there was always a chance that was not going to happen. You know, it's like um, like the Cobra's venom. You know, like. That that story, I mean, that was really just a prologue to uh, Doctor. I mean, Doctor Venom comes back, and uh, and there are some, and there, there there's, that's the the then culmination of the Blue Ninja storyline, right? Well, part of a culmination. It introduced a, a brand new Storm Shadow uh, Ninja Bot, which they, they had actually kind of forgot about for the last part part of the the story. So he sort of disappeared off off panel and uh and we've not seen him since right okay and right after that after the cobra's venom is artificial intelligence right yeah that's yeah right. so these these titles as like frameworks for four or five issues are loose and you know like the cobra civil war i don't know that it would have uh worked as well or been received the way that it was if in 1988 uh, and, you know, the editor had said to Hama or like someone at the Marvel bullpen had slapped like Cobra Civil War, part one of six on the cover. Because, you know, that story, it goes, you know, five or six or seven issues, depending on. Anyway, so um, uh, this is not this is not the ending I was expecting. Um, but I also ex- I, I know to expect the unexpected. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I don't think anyone could have predicted this would be the the issue that we got, or the reveal that we the got, or or the you know we'd uh, I guess that 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 it would continue. I guess in in the in the way that that it it now clearly is as well. So, um, if nothing else, you yeah you know expect the unexpected, and you will will inevitably get it as as well. And and I am not. You know, every chapter of this was very different from the previous chapter. Mm-hmm. You know, we even remarked that chapter one felt like another untold tale uh, or another, like, quote, special mm-hmm. missions issue. Um, and this one felt like that also. This felt really self contained. Um, and as tantalizing as the title, Murder by Assassination, is, I, I think this book would do better without titles and arcs. But maybe it's a sales tool. And if it has to have a title, maybe it's vague or maybe it's more about the format. You know, the way that Untold Tales is a title, but that's about the format. You know, like G.I. Mm-hmm. Joe One Shots. Or if this story had been called um, Around the Globe, you know, like, because <laughs> that's what it is. Every, it's like, you know, we're in, we're in, 
we're in Europe and we're in back at headquarters and we're in DC and we're in Southeast Asia, you know, like, oh, do you have around the world or across the globe part four? Like Alcabra's in it. Um, Mark, how do you feel about the reveal of Alcabra? I was very much sort of looking forward to and expecting some sort of big reveal. And the re- reveal that we got was, you know, much more understated. And, and I sort of did a bit of piecing back the jigsaw of the, pu- you know, the breadcrumbs that we've been fed so far across um, the piece. So, yeah, if you bear, bear with me, I'll sort of uh, I'll give you the uh, I'll give you the breadcrumbs that we were given. Uh, no, this is good. Up I, to, I want up these, to now. I want these breadcrumbs. Thank you. OK, so 281 costume blue headscarf shooting minions threatens gyro viper shoots va- vapor in the head consistency of uh, shooting minions superhuman leap is that a clue jump from the aspid as it crashes 282 costume gray coat hat sunglasses disguise at the capital killing minions he snaps the senator lartner's neck superhuman leap he leaps from the senate floor up to the gallery other notes, he uses a carbon fibre blade to get past the metal detectors. Al Calbra clue, he says to Sherlock, you're cocky for a mere MP sergeant, he recognises her. And then she says, I've heard that voice before. A suggestion that Sherlock recognises him from the previous issue? Somewhere else. 283, costume, back with the blue head- headscarf. Killing minions, he orders that the buyers in his weapon steal are shot. Superhuman leap. None, but he does make a speedy getaway via trap door. Other notes. Uh, Al Cobra is a big-time weapons dealer. 284. Costume. Blue head scarf, uh, followed by a suit at the end of the issue. Similar to the one that we saw in uh, 282. Killing minions. He shoots the customs inspector in the head. Al Cobra clue. He has a strange taste in pizza toppings. And now 285, costume, blue headscarf, killing minions. He shoots the Techno Viper in the head and attempts to shoot Overkill. Superhuman leap, he leaps from a crashing aspid again. And Al Calbra, linkage to, uh, to previous appearances, he boasts about taking Sherlock's arm off. So um, we've got sort of some, com- and, you know, the question mark is, is this all the same guy? We've sort of got some commonality about you know sherlock recognizing him him recognizing sherlock we've got general uh leaping about the place in a fairly superhuman way and we've also got uh this penchant for trying to shoot his minions in the uh in the head i i uh, one so so when he's re- revealed i had kind of this lingering doubt um uh you know that when sherlock said um i've heard that voice before that she could meant another time so so is there some someone else something else sort of connecting back to the past don't know and uh, in this issue when sherlock uh, reveals al Calbra's face she says what you're not and then is cut off so it potentially indicates that she is has someone in mind as to who al Calbra could be is she going you know, a specific person there but equally she could have been saying something else totally different as well like what you're not middle eastern or something uh, like that we, we won't find out because uh, fred cuts her uh, off so it's it's not any of the it's not any of the people that we were speculating about um he you know he's got a face of, of a fred but um you know does that mean that he's no one or does does that mean that he could still be anyone potentially because uh, a Fred, uh, you know, has plastic surgery to make them someone new, but they previously had a, a life before. So, you know, could potentially uh, Sherlock recognizing his voice mean that it's hearkening back to someone that she's encountered before? And then the surprise of the reveal uh, means that she doesn't recognize his face, and the voice and the face don't go together. Maybe. Um, and th- and then we talked about this, you know, speculation that you know the characters it could be. And uh, it was Chuck who said that, you know, maybe uh, Hammer could do a devil's due and just make him some sort of really obscure character from uh, from the past, like, uh, like you know, devil's due might be doing and reaching back into into sort of, um, you know, an obscure character and pluck him out. And um, we saw that a little bit, but in the form of a new character by uh, Overkill being uh, introduced in instead. 
so uh so we kind of got i think an interesting a slightly different reveal but you know at the very end of this plot but it was by introducing a new character rather than necessarily uh resolving it all with uh with the unveiling of al Calbra. something that you sort of alluded to there is that if al Calbra is a fred series clone could there be more than one al Calbra? so it, it, it feels yeah. it feels like you know they all shoot minions in the head and jump so <laughs> the suggestion is that it's just one person but if you've got you know a hundred fred clones um and your commander making this happen behind the scenes or a very uh hungry fred clone you could have five or 20 other fred clones just put on those glasses and call themselves al Cabra, and you could have this sort of like the the legend and the specter of this mm -hmm. arms dealer terrorist bad guy who sort of gets from point a to point b really quickly it's like well you know i'm in i'm in africa i'm gonna stop being al Cabra. other fred you're in europe start being al Cabra. Mm -hmm. you know or so that you make a good point that um sherlock seems to recognize recognizes the voice but is surprised that this person isn't who she was thinking it would be that that could either be something embedded in the story that we have experienced or something from her backstory that we uh haven't read i was i was a little disappointed that it was finger quotes just a fred uh when i actually got to that page but i also thought that so much of the marvel idw gi joe soap opera and mythology is built around these long-running characters reveals and misdirects right where you know like all of the crimson guards bit are freds like that blew my mind as a kid and i think i might be um uh bitter is too strong i think i might be sort of grumpy enough as a comics reader that if i read that in a gi joe comic now for the first time i'd say oh come on um and it's only where hama expanded on it uh I, mark help me out it was it was maybe 20 issues ago where a bunch of other different like cobra clones they're, they're not just freds there's like other names oh yeah was, yeah they've they've sort of alluded to different it was like, it was like um what would, what would like you call richards it? Different different variant and wendy's. Of, yeah 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 um, they, they had other names. different series of uh yeah of, and of cgs yeah and you, you and you you're using the word clone and i and i know that you don't mean clone but because uh that you know the the threads have been established of being people with their own identities who then have surgery to replace right, their face uh, to look, i mean i mean, uh, I mean right. I mean, clone in the most generic sense. So um, the fact that this is, finger quotes, just a Fred um, actually makes a lot of sense. And the question is now, where does the story go with it? Because Freds are really interesting to me, but the one or two that take over the story, you know, like Fred the Seventh and Fred the Eighth, or is this really the beginning of something that could mm -hmm. be um, bigger? Uh, in which case, you know, maybe it was less about Al Cabra as a mystery and more about um, digging back into this very G.I. Joe. Uh, I mean, I don't mean trope here in, in an insulting way. I mean, uh, just as a, like a topical theme. Um, like, oh, yeah, it's a Fred. Like, well, what, what's going to happen with this Fred? You know, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if... All right, so they've captured him. I would not be surprised if on the third page of the next issue, Sherlock <laughs> gets a phone call and she's like, wait, that Fred just broke out of custody? And then, you know, like... And and again, and I, this is just a sort of a, a, a like a parallel reflection of something I already said before. We don't know that Larry Hama knew who Al Calbra was until part five. I'm guessing he knew who it was earlier than part five. But, and we could ask him, but, you know, it could have been one character and then he changed his mind or it could have been mm -hmm. like, well, it's going to be one of these four characters and I'll see where the story goes. Or it could have been like, 
yeah, I'm just, I'm just, it's, it's someone mysterious and, and it might've been like an all new, like fictional head of some sort of real world terrorist group. Uh, it could have been, you know, Firefly. It could have been, you know, some random, like, uh, uh, who's the pirate? Sally? Is that what's Sally, the what's Sally Sarawak. Ser- uh, Sally Sarawak, right? The way that she got pulled out of one story from 1986, 1987, you know, like Al Cabra could have been, if I think if like the wind had gone a slightly different way, you know, like Hama's like typing it on a Wednesday afternoon on a computer in one room versus like thinking <laughs> about it while like cooking dinner on a Thursday evening in a different room, right? It might've been like, oh, there's that, I don't, like Tyrone comes back from the dead. Mm, Remember yeah. Tyrone? Um, so, you know, if I'm, if I'm giving the story and Hama a lot of latitude to like stumble or not be uh, tight or like narratively pack a narrative punch. I think that's sort of part of reading this comic. Like there's sort of, there's some rules for this comic. Like some stories are going to end really definitively, you know, like special missions four, you know, like special missions 20, uh, 29. Um, and, and some stories are not like murder by assassination part five. Yeah. And I think, you know, we, we're saying in inverted commas, um, he's just a Fred, but um, I, I, I suspect that there's there's story to come, which will mean that he's not just a Fred. He's, you know, a, a, he's a complex character with a, you know, with a past which somehow interconnects with uh, with with Sherlock or something along those uh, those lines. So, uh, yeah, we shall see if uh, there is more to this Fred than meets the eye. I do wonder if having it be a white American who was in disguise as uh, as someone Middle Eastern. Uh, like part of me wonders if that is taking a less interesting narrative road. But I also realize that Hama reads the newspaper, reads a lot of books, like knows politics and history. And so it's not a cop out, it's a choice. It's not like, oh, it'd just be easier if I keep it like a white guy since like a lot of G.I. Joe is like American and European. It's like, no, plenty of plenty of G.I. Joe takes place um, in the Middle East. And if creating fictional narratives of, you know, heroism and villainy in the context of like the real world geopolitical instability of that place is a challenge for G.I. Joe, you know, Hama is up to it. And I think this is... This is a choice, um, but you know his name definitely you know, Al Cabra. Like, oh, who is is this? Is this going to be like something like ISIS or Boko Haram in the real world? But now in the GI Joe universe, that's either a competitor of Cobra or some kind of uh, like the like the Red Shadows, some kind of um, team that helps Cobra. You know, like like the Blue Ninjas. I th- I think I was hoping for that, but. You know, I'm always ready to be surprised. Oh, it's a Fred. Okay, well, where's this going to go? So, so we we didn't quite get the reveal on on Al Cabra that we were expecting, but we instead get a new mystery about this character that he's working alongside. So, Overkill, who um, has a background of being, uh, you know, in the toy world, a um, you know, um, uh, the bat leader so he's released in 1992 originally as part of the talking battle commanders as a sort of rather garish looking looking character they've not gone for that same design uh they've instead gone for in, in the published book um a character that looks very much like uh, ghost bear um which was a figure released in 2004 packaged with the pulverizer as part of the valor versus venom line um, he's a mercenary uh, ghost bear. I'm talking about now. Uh, ghost bear is a mercenary, uh, and is Quinn's son. And and Andrew Griffith actually posted a picture of his original design for Overkill. And in his design, he looks very different to uh, to the published version, which is um, very grey. Uh, in the in the published design, he looks very much like a V1 Viper. He's got the black boots, the blue uh, trousers with 
red piping up the side, a uh, blue top with a red uh, Cobra logo. He's got a much more pronounced robotic right arm, uh, the red uh, robotic eye, um, metallic mouthpiece, uh, but most of the face and scalp where there isn't hair is actually uh, skin tone. So at some at some point, either a colouring decision or a, an editorial decision, they, they've decided to go a different way in terms of how this guy looks. Maybe maybe the the similarity to uh, the Viper was was too on on the nose. It kind of put me a little bit in in mind of the look of the V2 Mercer, who has this um, his right um, arm is looks somewhat robotic. Um, you know, potentially the the toy is sort of covered in a kind of uh, chainmail or something like that. But you know, again, you've got some of these these sort of touches of blue trousers, you know, black boots, uh, you know, black top and and sort of red red piping and detailing, which. Is I think supposed to put you in mind of uh, the Viper, given that he's uh, meant to be an ex Viper. Um, so if so... I if I can slightly if I can slightly restate something that you have stated mm. for our listeners who may uh, not be reading the comics currently or not know a lot about 1992 figures. Um, so the original Overkill uh, Overkill has never appeared in the in the Marvel IDW Larry Hama G.I. Joe comic. And right. so the fact that he's showing up here is a, a very interesting surprise, right? Mm-hmm. So so separate from like, oh, Al Cabra gets revealed and also here's Overkill. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, everyone, it's 2021 and Overkill first showed up in September of 1991 in the uh, what I call season four premiere of G.I. Joe, what pe- a lot of people would call G.I. Joe series two, season two, right? The Deke episodes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he is a robot, right? Like, I can't, I can't state clearly enough how exciting <laughs> and disorienting this appearance by this character is, because if this is vintage overkill, not only are the colors wrong or different, uh, not only is the costume very different although the the face and head feel somewhat analogous this is his first appearance and that's actually 30 years ago and then adding to the uh confusion or mystery or excitement as mark alluded to uh, andrew lee griffith posts this drawing of his overkill uh design and it's the same design that we see in the published issue but the colors are different and absolutely it looks like mercer version two it's it looks if you squint you'd think it's like a a a viper without their helmet and and so 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 then the question is okay are hama and griffith actually introducing the original bat commander from 1991 1992 in some pre-robot version where, you know, maybe there'll be an explosion and he gets, his brain gets put into a robot body or something. And then we see that, that, uh, that full costume design, you know, with like garish red and orange gold and green and black from 1991, 1992. Or is this the uh, 2018 uh, action figure that was um, part of the action figure subscription uh service from the like the the fan club or the website right and and this doesn't that overkill doesn't look more like this guy who we see in the new issue or so is it is it 91 92 overkill is it 2018 overkill or is arhama and griffith just coming up with a new character yeah for sure and calling him overkill and because we like need to find meaning, start assigning similarities and connections where there may not actually be, you know, like, you know, Hama has very little. Oh, sorry. Okay, I'm I'm, I'm looking at a picture and 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 uh, apologies, everyone. The uh, the 2018 um, subscription service figure is is an update of the 2003 GI Joe versus Cobra uh, two pack, right? Where the the sort of the 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 things that most make overkill overkill are these two figures um 
black and teal and he's got a, a big red sort of um scarf uh handkerchief around his oh, yeah. his mm-hmm. face and it drapes down onto his chest right so um but maybe Hama and Griffith are just coming up with a new guy and that's a cool name and that's a cool name that they came up with sort of coincidentally or that is available in the G.I. Joe pantheon and it actually doesn't connect to any of these characters um, yeah and I, so, I think they've they've gone for saying we we've got a cool name we've got this idea of a bat commander but you know we we don't maybe like the idea of it being a robot commander in the original design so beyond that that concept of the name and a the idea of there being a bat commander we can we'll just do something completely different right um what what i'm sure they are definitely not doing is following is trying to do a repeat of the use of uh the devil's due overkill um which had his own backstory that that was introduced by devil's devil's due so um i'm entirely sure that whatever they they do they won't be recycling um that story but the the mystery that that I had sort of ties into our speculation a bit on uh, who Al Cowboy could be, and now I'm thinking who is Overkill, and and I'm going to recycle a, a theory which is that Overkill might be Billy, right? That um, uh, Billy died. He had a well, he had a before he died, he had a robot leg. This this new Al Co- uh, this new Overkill is clearly you know part cybernetic and and could could the uh you know dead billy that that um uh cobra commander was incredibly grief stricken about um have have been somehow been brought back to life using bat and, and possibly blue ninja technology to to make it you know restore him back to to life but very much uh you know a cyborg version of uh of the character and uh you know, uh, maybe and yeah, that's the mystery. Potentially, th- that's who as, this could be. As much as I want this to be someone, as much as I'd like this to connect, I'm also happy for characters to not come back from the dead. So, <laughs> Billy, cool, good guess. If this is just someone else or someone new, also cool. Um, do you have any guesses for how a Fred can uh, have? such powerful jumps or are, are <laughs> you know. are you reading too much into the fact that it's you know an exciting comic book and like i mean the joes jump off helicopters sometimes and yeah. you know from like one desk to another in the u.s capital it's it's hard to say isn't it it was um part of that i guess was the speculation that you know if if fred was um, potentially someone like billy with a cybernetic leg then, then maybe that might explain, uh, you know, quite how well he was able to jump a jump about. Um, maybe he's just really good at jumping, and it's a comic book, and I shouldn't worry too much about the fact that he does seem to do a lot of jumping. Maybe, um, maybe in in a previous story, his code name was Jumper. <laughs> and no, okay. Um, so um shall shall we talk about so we've got you know we've got the sort of story wrapping up in in some ways but we've also got a new mystery being set up which is the mystery of the construction bats or bats as a lot of people uh have want to say uh you know what are they doing in the jungle they need to be they need to get them to uh to the port I think the cobra said uh, are these fourth or fifth generation bats uh, i'm not counting i don't know if uh if you are but there seems to be a few generations of them uh, <laughs> but uh you know it's uh that you know introducing uh a a new a new plot around the these bats and it does seem to be one that um uh they're expecting to uh to follow up on um so as a i've talked a lot about um wanting to see characters sort of in their costume or in sort of the the right costume for the moment, even if it's the wrong costume. You know, like if Gung Ho's in the Arctic, I don't want him wearing like a full white like polar suit. I want I want some version of his hat or his, you know, his vest, right? It has to somehow say uh Gung Ho. And um even though I don't like the version two bat, 
uh, mm. action figure, and I don't like how they look when they show up in the Andrew Wildman issues around uh, 128. There are now enough bat toys that if you're going to have a variation of a bat, either because it's construction or because you're calling it like fifth generation, I do think it'd be really fun to draw a different bat rather mm. than the 1986 bat. Um, and similarly, uh, there's this page where uh, it's page 13 where um, a bunch of bats get shot and then Overkill says, all specialized construction bats into the Aspids. We need to get you to, as you just said, to the to the port. And we see four bats walking into a container and uh, their arms are sort of beefier than normal. And then in the next mm. panel, he explains, uh, all their weapons have been removed and replaced with tools. They are useless in a fight. And I thought, oh man, what a bummer that we didn't have uh, a slightly different angle on this panel where they're walking away from us where or we didn't have sort of one additional panel or a, a different version of a scene like okay if you're going to mention construction bats i really want to see them doing some constructing or like finishing doing some construction with these arms and you know the original bat toy has that giant claw mm -hmm. and I don't remember the Rod Wiggum issues where the bats actually show up in the 40s, I think. but uh, Or maybe it's the 50s. But I don't think we've really seen the like giant claw from the 1986 toy yeah. in this comic. And so I, I so wish that, one, these bats looked more different because there are now so many different bat toys. And two, uh, that we could see those arms better. And three, that uh, Jay Brown would take the opportunity to color those arms differently to make them that much more clear just in this one panel where they're walking away from us into this container um, so that they look more like construction-y, like yellow or orange, just the, just the arms. Um, and while I'm, <laughs> while I'm complaining about color choices for bats, on the previous page, this is page 12, in the second panel, uh, bats are coming at some Joes uh, point blank and they're shooting at each other and there are some great sound effects. Brap, 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 poom. And uh, Jay Brown colors the bat faces and chests and shoulders the same. And so there's this weird like sort of cloning of this like silvery round shape on the top of the page because there's a second wave of bats behind the first wave of bats, but we just see their chests. And part of the excitement of the original bat toy was this amazing lenticular sticker on their chests, right? It's like what we used to call informally wiggle, right? Like you, you know, you wiggle it back and forth and the image <laughs> slightly changes in perspective. And, and the wiggle image on the 1986 bat, that is a, that's a, that's a drawing that Ron Rudat did. Uh -huh. which like got figured out in Texas, right? Like to make that sticker, that was an extra step for, uh, you know, and it's, and it's on Lightfoot's uh, little tank too, right? It's, oh, an yeah. extra, mm -hmm. it's an extra step, that's an extra expense, and it makes the bat so cool. My brother and I were so excited yeah. when we each got a bat. And so like Jay Brown, please put a little bit of that fun color in the chest plates of these bats when we can see them. And then notice what happens in the color on the next page. This panel where the bats are walking into the container ship there's all this fun color in their backpacks yeah. and yet no 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 it's their backpacks that are all black and it's their chests that have little glints of red and orange and green so um. uh, <laughs> in my in my character design storytelling and color choice these two pages uh were were very um they were i had a lot of anxiety reading these two pages <laughs> I mean, like, like not anxiety, yeah. like, oh, yeah, what's yeah. gonna happen? But like, oh man, come on! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, I was, then I the, was anxious then it... for the for the Joes for you know blooping their frags at uh, the bats uh, with you know barely a, a meter distance between themselves, and uh... Uh, which actually reminds me of a question that I have. A couple pages later, the Joes fire missiles from the back of the Stinger at the Aspid. And uh, two XO4 missiles left on the stinger. I bet they're heat seekers. Foosh, foosh. Great lettering. Great shapes on those fooshes, which follow the contours of the 
the missile trails. I don't know a lot about heat-seeking missiles, but I feel like I've read stories or seen movies where someone fires a heat-seeking missile, but it needs a certain amount of distance before mm -hmm. it, distance either the missile well. can mm -hmm. either it, before it can arm or before it can actually like register the heat signature. So when I got to this panel, I wondered, wait, is that aspid too close? Is the missile just going to like bounce off it or like go past it and blow up? But then it blows it up. So that's fine. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. Uh, so I, th so the answer to my question is, uh, no, the heat seeking missiles on the back of a stinger do have a heat lock from the moment that they're launched. And yes, they are armed short distance, sh short range. Okay, I feel we, like we've been bouncing about all over the place, but I think I've said the things that I wanted to say. Um, um, I, had, I had one or two more sort of bad, yeah. I had one more badass things to, to point out. Uh, two panels after this panel with the bats walking away from us that I'll never stop talking about. Uh, two panels away, um, Alcabra tries to shoot Overkill in the head. Mm -hmm. Very close. Nobody disobeys me and lives. Blam. Kaping! Not everybody has steel implants in their skulls like I do. Okay. Uh, one, maybe maybe this does suggest a backstory. You know, like, did, did Billy get shot in the head? Um, but also, man, that's cool. A Joe bad guy just got shot in the head. Not quite point blank range, but very close range. And mm -hmm. it bounced off. Right? That's cool and exciting. So some bad assery uh, <laughs> added to that... Uh, uh, to that uh, character. And, um, yeah, and also, you know, Al Cabra, he's at it again, trying to shoot his underlings in the head. Come on. Yeah, uh, I, like I, a... I wonder I wonder what um, Hama's thinking is there if sort of at the very beginning he thought, like, well, I just need to make him a really vicious, terrible villain. Because I really like this thread where he's sacrificing and disrespectful to Cobra soldiers. Because mm -hmm. I feel like Cobra's filled with terrible people and... And I'm, we, I think we would see that sort of in the ongoing story, you know, more than just like in the cartoon where Cobra Commander is always yelling retreat, he gets away and a bunch of generic Cobra <laughs> soldiers uh, get taken prisoner by the Joes. But it gets his comeuppance as well, because the next next panel, uh, he gets he gets thwapped across the room by uh, by Overkill with a, you know, with the back of his hand as uh, he makes his escape. So we know one more thing about Overkill, which is that he has super strength, right? Mm. This is not like comic book exaggeration, like maybe some Joes or Al Cabra can jump a great distance, but uh, Overkill literally backhand smacks Al Cabra and he is pushed across the room. Um, I, have a, uh, I have an error detected. Error detected. Error detected. No prize incoming. Page five, uh, panel two. This is while the Joes uh, are starting to shoot at this um, uh, this this base right at the edge of the jungle, uh, and Falcon's yelling, "Suppress that fire!" Uh, Sherlock is behind him and firing. And in this panel, the Joes their fire is red, and Cobra's mm -hmm. fire is green. And uh, there is clearly a laser uh, a, a, a gun blast beam that lines up with. Um, Sherlock's weapon that's behind Falcon that is colored green. Uh -huh. So one of those green beams should also be red. Yeah, and and the the angles of some of that fire sort of looks is is a little bit dodgy as well. I think in terms of where where is it coming from, particularly in that first panel, it looks like it looks like it's coming from behind Muskrat, you know, from the jungle rather from perhaps the, the towers. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. The the, the error detected that I had was uh, back in the, the hangar as uh, Al Cowboy is making his escape. He says, Heli Viper, power up that remaining aspid and get ready for immediate takeoff. And the person replies, the Techno Vipers never finish securing the cargo container. Um, but the person replying is a Techno Viper. So um, uh, it, it sounds like he was meant to have been a Heli Viper. Hmm. I spy with my little eye. Um, in the world of I spy, um, we talked about uh, spying ghost bear, but it's actually uh, overkill. Crosshairs. Oh no, it's wet wetsuit. So uh, crosshair was uh, one of the 
later additions to the G.I. Joe canon around about 2003, um, but uh, looking very much uh, like the way that Wetsuit is uh, drawn here. Although in uh, canon, uh, I think we have established that Wetsuit does sort of dress in this sort of similar mission, where, uh, sorry, similar look when out of uh, out of the sea uh, he has the you know floppy hat whatever word is the correct way to to describe that um it's it's good that he dresses like this uh when he's out of his wetsuit because in the cartoon uh particularly in this episode ninja holiday wetsuit when he's not in his wetsuit wears a white button-up shirt and blue pants <laughs> okay uh, sort of sort of looks like he's just dressing up as shipwreck's friend right. uh, which as a kid I, I didn't mind i think even then i sort of understood like well he wouldn't be walking around you know like saigon with a with a wetsuit on when like sergeant slaughter's in his you know uh shirt and pants uh we've um, got uh recoil spotted here without his uh his blue gun and he's very much alive, uh, sort of whenever, whenever we've seen. I think uh, a lot of people sort of go, hold on, didn't, didn't he die? But uh, yeah, he ta- takes a hit uh, all the way back in issue 113 um, in the, that issue where Sneak Peek dies. But um, yeah, it looked like it was a nast- nasty wound, but uh, never established that yeah, he died. So, uh, you know, very much in the world of the living. Do you have another one? Uh, my my final one is that uh, once again I spy Al Calbra escaping from an aspid that has been shot down. Um, just another one of his hobbies. Maybe maybe uh, his his previous maybe his previous code name wasn't Jumper. Maybe it was Aspid Jumper Chopper <laughs> Jumper. Um, jumper. In the uh, right at the the page right after this is this isn't quite a nice spy. The page right after Al Calbra shoots the Techno Viper in the head. Uh, we see two aspids, and all the way on the right, we see a vehicle um, with a, a big tire, mm. and um, we see just a, a tiny bit of the front corner of it, and it looks to me sort of like a Rage, but I don't think the design quite lines up. It also sort of looks like the front of the Thunder Machine, if you took the Gatling guns mm-hmm. off. So this is uh, less of an I spy and more of a question um, do you think this is a G.I. Joe vehicle uh, or do you think this is just sort of a vehicle that you would see in a warehouse where you might have some cargo hel- helicopters? But if it's yeah, a G.I. Joe vehicle, hey, that's fun. Yeah, I wonder. I wonder if uh, if something was something particular was in mind or or not. Hmm. Yeah, I wouldn't like to stake any guess just based on the based on that picture and my, my own knowledge. Um, you know what? Wait, I want to. Wait, can we go back to your where Al Cabra says Hello Viper, power up that remaining aspid and the, yep, the Techno okay. Viper. Uh I think I think Al Cabra is talking to the Hello Viper in the Aspid. And I think the Techno Viper who's on the ground is correcting him. Like, but sir, we Techno Vipers never finished securing the cargo container. Right. And then but to add a yeah. few words, I think Al Cabra's dialogue would then be forget the container tech techno viper i'm having the hella viper leave without it mark so actually i don't think that's i don't think that's an error detected yeah sorry it is um <laughs> i think i think the error detected is that the whoever is in that aspid if it's a hella viper i think his helmet wouldn't be blue aren't the hella viper's helmets red i can't remember um yeah i don't know um maybe maybe the, the error is that the bubble um trail should be pointing towards the pilot rather than towards the techno viper because the techno viper there is talking in the third person the techno viper is never finished uh, blah, blah, blah. um um i have a i have a little uh uh thing to, to point out just in the for those of you who who read this issue digitally i don't think you're experiencing this after the final page there's a cover for next month there's a one page letters page and then there's a four-page preview of a Transformers miniseries drawn by Augustin Padilla, who was the first artist uh-huh. on the IDW continuation of the Larry Hama Marvel run. Augustin Padilla drew the first, was it five issues or, or six issues before, um, Shannon, mm-hmm. before Shannon Gallant 
came on for a very, very long time. And uh, Mr. Padilla's uh, uh, work looks good here. I'm still not, still not the biggest fan of his work. Um, I find it. Uh, I mean, it's it's a it's a it's not a good comparison because this is four pages with one talking Dinobot as opposed to like you know ten Joes and five Cobras. Um, but uh, I think his, his I think his drawings are pretty good, but I think his storytelling could be a little clearer, uh, and that goes back to a, a Transformers one shot that he drew like eight years ago. But just as a little. Um, just as little like synchronicity or coincidence, you know, I'm reading this GI Joe comic and I turn the page and instead of four pages of IDW ads, it's Transformers comics drawn by this guy who's drawn GI Joe. And, and there's, there's often, maybe the point I'm making is, um, there's not a lot of crossover between uh, the people, uh, I mean, Andrew Griffith, Andrew Griffith, <laughs> yes, but um, you so, Andrew Wellman. You think, <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I mean, I mean, in the in the modern era. Uh, well, Mark, huh, Mark Bright. Uh, Freddie Williams. Anyway, um, <laughs> but you know, I turn the page, and it's 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 you know, as as we're nearing issue three hundred, it's oh hey, it's that guy who drew issue one hundred and fifty six through one hundred and sixty or so. Yeah, uh, I have a hammer time. Stop. Hammer time. Time to beat the soles of your boots with my face. Sucking chest wounds, red ninjas, brain scanners, rubber hooses, blue ninjas. Hammer time. So we've got, uh, we've got uh, the whole team being introduced by name in the order that uh, that they're shown, which is uh, always a joy to behold. Um, we've got. I'm right behind you, Muskrat Falcon. Bring up the rest. I hear you, wetsuit Sherlock and Multo. Tighten it up. What's shaking down, rock and roll? Coming to a clearing recoil, etc. So, uh, yeah, a, a nice, nice little uh, recap introduction. Who and explaining exactly who is on the team. I see a hammer, a hammer time, hammer time. Uh, when the bats are deployed and they're walking towards the Joes, and the Joes are shooting the bats, and the bats are shooting the Joes. Uh, Falcon says, they're attacking line abreast. That's to our advantage. Rock and roll, you and Wetsuit go right and left to bring enf uh, enfilade fire on their flanks while the rest of us cover you. Um, so military tactic thing. Uh, and then Andrew Griffith draws it uh, nicely and clearly where the uh, five Joes who stayed are sort of bunched up together and pin a little pinned down and then from one side and from another rock and roll and uh and wetsuit uh uh fire unleash that enfilade fire yeah <laughs> um i think on enfilade fire was uh uh al cabra's previous code name if, if he was a character <laughs> who had a code name i think he uh, yeah the enfilade jumper um enfilade. yeah um favorite line of dialogue quote of the week quote of the week quote of the week quote of the week uh, Falcon and Sherlock are under a poncho, so they can look at this uh, mm -hmm. um, tablet or hologram thing. And he says, uh, what's that opening in one of the buildings? Can you zoom in? And uh, I don't know. I think he, he says it. The roof, the roof opens. Helipad hidden inside. And again, you know, I, I, I think I say this every episode. This is Hama thinking through how how a, a a villain would be in a physical space, right? Or this is Hama like reading an article like six months ago, or reading a book fifteen years ago, and it's like, oh yeah, in Vietnam there are like warehouses where the ceilings are open because they have hidden helipads, right? And like that just ends up being a very small part of this story, and it it just is like as window dressing and scene setting to give that much more authenticity uh, to these Joes stalking through uh, the forest. Just a small little thing that uh, adds a lot. You know, it, you could do that so generically, like, oh yeah, beyond the clearing, there's some buildings. They have helicopters in there. Yeah, and, and also it's it's doing a couple of things. It's it's sort of helping helping us when we get to that point later on in the story 
when when they make their escape with the aspids that it's you know helping that thought process of understanding you know where how, how things are happening and how they're moving and you know Oh, yeah, that course, aspids it's already are been going, established that the, the aspids the are going to take off from inside this building. Uh, and, and also, yeah, and also it's sort of like just you know giving us a subtle you know update and reminder that that we're living in the the modern world and and the sort of the Joes are making use of some of the newer technology that's available to you know to them that they're not just stumbling in blind through the through the jungle. There, that you know. Yeah, doing, it's it's not all radio. Uh, yeah. Um, mine was uh, the, what we alluded to we alluded to before. We've got Al Calbra with his penchant for for shooting his underlings in in the head. He's uh, he's been called up by a techno viper. Um, he says deploying deploying my specially modified construction bats as cannon fodder is stupid and a big mistake, Al Calbra. You can't. He says calling me stupid and telling me I can't do something is your big mistake, techno viper. Blam! Shoots him in the head. Now, Overkill, you're not making any mistakes, are you? Absolutely not. Good, then stay out my way. I think because the ending wasn't what I was expecting. When I read the issue, I was uh, a little disappointed. But in talking about it, and, you know, in a week, in a year, when I reread this issue, I will like it more. And Mm. it won't bear the burden of needing to wrap up this five-part story in a certain way because i've learned my lesson you know <laughs> a, 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 a gi joe a real american hero five-parter you know like it this would have been the same story if if it hadn't had this title and these five chapters you know like it's like you know what what does tom waltz say in the in the, in the letters page um uh, return in 30 days to bring you the first of five spotlight issues, all of which will serve to both advance the current storyline mm. while simultaneously focusing on fan favorite characters. Right? So, like, I can imagine a reader of this comic being disappointed by the by part five of this story and then disappointed or thrown off that sort of part six of five you know, is, is, is like this sort of one shot, which is going to continue. The, and then like part seven of five, eight, nine, 10, 11 of five, like the next five parts of this five part story are going to continue the story, but also spotlight these characters as sort of self-contained issues. And that, that, that is some kind of failure. And I think it's the opposite. I think it shows what a um, flexible writer Hama is and and if that's overdoing it, I think it's a testament to how uh, organic this comic is in its publishing. Because, like, at this point, I mean, for there are very few comics like this, right? And there are very few comparisons in comics to be made. You know, like, Lee and Kirby on 100 issues of Thor, Lee and Kirby on 100 issues of Fantastic Four, um, like, Evanier and... You know, like, like you can name on two hands the number of runs where there's a writer or a writer and an artist who've done uh, 100 issues. But when it gets to 150 or th- closing in on 300 issues, um, so I love that, uh, you know, Hama says to Tom Waltz, like, I, I think I want to do some sort of spotlights on these characters, but maybe not, like, jump back in time and do flashbacks. Mm. Like, I think we should keep up with Al Cabra and this mystery or you know waltz makes that suggestion and um and and this this does feel like you know chris claremont's run on on canny x-men where you know he starts it when he's younger and it's so, sort of a surprise that he gets it and for a time it is the most popular thing that marvel publishes and uh then like his connection to it ends and then later he's invited back and then but in the case of Hama and G.I. Joe uh that that invitation back is sort of permanent or ongoing um so it's a sprawling you know the brand as the the good guys and the bad guys there's there are hundreds of characters so um I I think the fact that the the narrative lumbers about uh is in keeping with the population of the brand and like 
and how the comic has always been, you know, like four times a year, you got to advertise, you got to use some characters from a commercial. It's like, oh man, I was doing this other thing and now I have to have half an <laughs> issue in the Arctic, right? And, and there isn't that challenge now. It's not like introduce this toy, introduce this toy. And now it's like, oh man, who, 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 who should I use? Or like, how retro should this be? Or um, maybe I should introduce some new characters because there's like no black woman on G.I. Joe. Yeah. I do appreciate that comment from Tom Waltz about the, the current storyline uh, being advanced because as much as I enjoyed the Untold Tales arc and the quality of those those stories, I, I do like to see the sort of the wider narrative being advanced and particularly with, with all of these elements that have been been set up. I do uh, I do you know have a hankering to to find out where the plot is going to go. You know what what what's going to happen next with this Al Calbra now that he's been revealed. How how will you know these new Joes sort of be be used uh, in in stories beyond the ones that we've seen before? What's you know what's going to happen next with Overkill and uh, these mysterious construction bats? You know what 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 other threads that have been set up in the in the in the past few few issues um you know where are they gonna gonna go etc so uh yeah look, looking forward to to see uh to see the ongoing threads uh, sort of progressing if there was going to be a self-contained issue that is out of time like a flashback self-contained issue i would rather that be um a side series not that we're always going to get you know gi joe mm-hmm. special missions or uh um uh, silent option um if it's going to be in the story i'd like it to be you know like 26 and 27 or is it yeah uh, is it 144 yeah yeah where or or the god the flashbacks in the snake eyes trilogy you know which which sort of were reflecting what was happening uh in in the present day and Mm -hmm. the baroness is so angry at snake eyes uh, I, those are those are particularly satisfying because they both reveal something and also move the story forward without, you know, like the untold tales the last time around, pausing the story. Okay, so um, we've not actually given any yo joage to 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 this yet, so um, I think now's the opportune time to to do it. I think I'm probably in the a similar main mind frame. Um, to to you tim in in terms of feeling a little bit disappointed that that the story wasn't wrapped up but um you know as i you know think about it sort of you know the the intrigue that has sort of been intro- introduced and and sort of some of the ongoing mystery you know i'm happy that that this is just part of an ongoing narrative and it doesn't have to have a f- definitive full stop uh, attached to it so um you know still enjoyed the uh the issue still enjoyed uh, the the arc and i and i hope that the the threads that kind of been um you know and the mysteries that have been set up kind of continue to to be followed up so um i think probably a seven on this one overall i also give this a seven for the same reasons um and continuing that 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 thread i've actually got time here now for uh, listener question. Question. What did we ask this week? Let's find out as we speak. So we would have been talking about the, the spotlight issues that are coming up. And uh, all five have now been announced. We've got 286, uh, Spotlight on Storm Shadow. 287, The New Joes, Molto, Sherlock and Black Hat. Uh, 288, uh, Falcon and Special Forces. Uh, 289 dawn and helix and 290 the october guard which i particularly am looking forward to and i asked our listeners over on the social media um what uh you know who they would like to be uh you know have a spotlight shone upon them um uh, as part of uh you know a potential gi joe spotlight so here are some of the uh, reactions that that garnered. So, Stefan Miller said, Ricondo or the uh, lesser explored original Joes, such as Short Fuse and Zap. Uh, Carol, aka Richard Straw, Ripcord, star of the show for a brief while, then largely forgotten about. 
yeah definitely enjoyed uh the ripcord uh ripcord story though i think um larry has kind of described his his arc as pretty much done he's served his purpose magnus the lego master builder uh said i will cast a vote for tunnel rat how did the shorter guy from brooklyn get into the joe team and why does the eod guy carry such a big backpack warp point and carry the machine gun is he trying to do everything prove something to his teammates or to himself trying to redeem himself for some screw up early on he has another good suggestion as well what about dodger the lone Battle Force 2000 survivor. We haven't seen much of him since the war in Trucial Abysmia. He'd be uh, an opportunity to explore survivors' guilt. Yeah. Um, I have thought about, uh, and, you know, this might be sort of diminishing returns because, you know, Hama has, he gets to pick and there are too many characters to pick from. But there are characters who got, to, you know, here we're, here we're seeing Overkill, maybe, for the first time, if it's that 91, 92 Overkill. Um, uh, I've been thinking about some of the, like, the, the second year of DEF that wasn't released as DEF, like uh, Mace. Was Mace ever, was Mace ever in the comic? You know, and, and the way that we got... Um, uh, Sightline. So I've been thinking of actually n- newer characters who either got a toy in the early 90s who never showed up, or newer characters from. Uh, I, I'm <laughs> this. This isn't very fair of me. I'm not interested in any of the new characters from like 2002 <laughs> to 2006 because I don't. I don't think I like a lot of those action figures. But uh, you know, we've had a. Um, who's the? Uh, is it Tombstone? Uh, who's the big black cobra guy who was introduced in like 2015 in a two pack? Um, like, uh, I'm you know I'm always interested in in another yeah, interesting looking guy, isn't he? Uh, I'm always interested in an, and he has a scar on his face, right? Yeah. I'm always interested in another individual cobra, not you know one of many vipers who is not. Um, sort of bogged down with like death and rebirth and cloning like venom dr venom dr mindbender uh or even to some extent the baroness since she's escaped death uh you know once um so tombstone it took me a long time to get a tombstone <laughs> i'd like to see an issue uh with tombstone and you know if 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 there needs to be some joke like ghost rider where they can't actually say his name in the comics <laughs> because another publisher uh has that name then i'm uh, that that'd be that'd also be fine Uh, (laughs) but you know hama has said a couple times i think on facebook sometimes i write about whatever character is in front of me you know like like oh well i had a toy of that character in front of me and he has downsized in the last couple years he's you know gotten rid of many things and uh i think he 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 sorry i don't think i know he has one or two of the 3d joe's posters with Mm -hmm. You know, like a, a picture of every Joe from like 82 to 86. And, you know, certainly he can like go to Yo-Jo or 3D Joes. Um, but uh, every so often I've thought I should just mail Larry Hama a tombstone. <laughs> I think that'll do like, it. <laughs> uh, but also, you know, that also could be like an unwelcome, like, don't don't mail me crap. <laughs> what, do you want me to sign this and ship this back to you? It's like, don't that's an that. intrusion. No, 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 no. Don't do um, that. But uh, tombstone tombstone because cool. he comes in a two-pack with duke right so the sort of implication there is that he and duke like they need to square off in the in the sort of story of the toy tombstone okay cool uh a few more we had through hit and run uh great action figure judging from his file card a difficult start to life uh because i think his parents were killed in a hit and run right so um of course some you know, fair, a fairly dark origin there to, to his choosing that that code name. Um, Bart came in with low light. Um, just because you can, don't mean you should. Um, he shows a lot. Uh, shows a lot about his character. I'm a sniper at heart. There's that special issues special uh, missions issue where he knocks out the target with the butt of his rifle rather than using his deadly skills. Uh, Al Vega would like to see the original thirteen. Uh, Peter, a.k.a. Idiot Brain, um, that's an interesting nickname he's given himself, 
I'd like to see Cobra's leadership ranks fleshed out a bit, which currently seems like it's just Cobra Commander and Mindbender. So uh, Tomax and Zamot, Cesspool, Big Boa even. And uh, Tombstone. I think would be the one to introduce and 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 scrap iron and someone brought up scrap iron a couple issues ago on the letters page and Hama said hmm. hmm and hey all of you listeners thank you for responding in the Facebook comments to Mark's question it is only slightly harder to put that suggestion into an email <laughs> to IDW than it is to type it into uh, a response in Facebook in the Talking Joe page so listeners please 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 send an email to letters at idwpublishing.com and put G.I. Joe or G.I. Joe A-R-A-H in the subject line and um, make suggestions. Who, who would you like to see, right? Like, remember in the 80s, this book was getting thousands and thousands of letters every week, paper letters, which is emotional and undeniable because it's in a big box, right? And nowadays it's getting not very many emails a month. And mm. so the people who make this book um, are a little bit out on their own out there making this book. So let them know, let them know what you want. And it's, it's it, uh, secondarily everyone, it's time to start making suggestions for the 40th anniversary issue, which should be out in March or April of next year. And also issue 300, which should be out <laughs> uh, like, six or eight months after that. So everyone who's listening, um, please send one or two emails to the nice editors at IDW. A two sentence email is, is great. You don't have, this doesn't have to be a big essay about um, how much the comic means to you or where you get it. Uh, although I, they read that too, but please make suggestions for who you want to see and, and tell them what you want to see for the, the big anniversaries coming up. Cause this comic is is a big deal, and we need to treat it that way. Cool. I'll just wrap up with the the final few we had through European Joes on Twitter. Tollbooth. What what does he do when there are no bridges to be laid? <laughs> uh, friend of the show, Paddy Lennon said, uh, out of left field answer here, but I'd love to see a series of special missions focusing on the vehicles and drivers. Hammer has given us some great one shots with the Sky Striker. I want comics focusing on more vehicles. Ore Striker, Hydrofoil, Bug, Battle Barge. Uh, Wedge Cap said, Larry still owes us a proper Zartan origin issue. I wrote a letter about it early in the ARA IW, IDW relaunch days, and I believe he implied that he had one in mind. Hmm. What, wait, who, who, who said that? Uh, who, who Wedge Cap. Wedge Cap, please send another email to letters <laughs> at... Letters at idwpublishing.com. Please politely remind Tom Waltz and Larry Hama and nudge them. Uh, Skinny Joe fan, General Flag, how does one get put in charge of the G.I. Joe team at such a young age? White privilege. Um, too much. Um, Ron Joseph, uh, character, Quinn, reason, because I like him. Wait, is that Ron Joseph who drew some issues at G.I. Joe? That's right. <laughs> oh, man, that's this story's half written already. I mean, not really, but I know who's gonna who could draw that issue. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there we go. Um, uh, and yeah, thanks. Thanks to everyone for all of your suggestions uh, and uh, joining in. I've been sit sitting on some of those for quite a long time. So uh, thanks for your patience. Uh, more listeners questions as and when i decide to ask them maybe um you know what actually you know what uh maybe mark maybe we can turn some of these listener questions why don't we why don't we type that up as an email and send that to letters at idwpublishing.com dear postbox the pit uh we have a podcast we had listener questions here are some characters people would like to see why not and we can include their names so that they know that we're not just listing our own picks, but that, you know, like Upside Down Cake 21 <laughs> wants to see like Tombstone fight Duke, right? Maybe, maybe Tombstone and uh, what's Duke's wife's name? Oh, um, maybe they have a backstory. Well, they uh, yeah, it's been hinted, hasn't it? Um, 
My mind's gone blank yeah. on the name. Um, Claire, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm thanking myself oh. for my, my brain working. I'll say it. Good job. <laughs> um, but hey, but listeners, please don't let the, the my threat of us sending an email kind of on your behalf talk you out of it, right? Um, it's hard making comics, and it's really nice to hear from your from your uh, fans and, and readers. So if you can hear my voice, please write a two-sentence email to IDW telling them what you'd like to see in the G.I. Joe comic and which artists you'd like to draw the book. And if, and if, you're, if you're feeling like, you know, well, the last 10 people who've drawn this book are all good and it's not helpful to say, I like all 10 people who've drawn this book, get them all back. That's not unhelpful, that is helpful. Because if no one says anything, maybe the editor keeps thinking, ah, I guess we have to find someone new because no one said anything good about the current person. <laughs> oh, no. So please, 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 everyone. Innuendo, do you want to do, do a quick innuendo? I do. This is how the story goes. Attention. At this moment, you are now listening to a talking innuendo. If you are offended by words like sucking, flesh wound, willy, Pete, balls, crystal balls, hypno shield, whatever, take the tape out now. This is not a pop album. And by the way, suck my grandmother's mother- brick in a Prada handbag. Tombstone. <laughs> All right, I, I win, you lose. Oh, no. That's not the way it works. Okay. To- oh, I didn't say it suggestively enough. Hold on. <clears throat> Tombstone. All right, go ahead. Uh, so, so this is the segment of the show where I, I read out some G.I. Joe names. Uh, they sound, you know, to me, a little bit dirty. But, but the, you know, the, the, the hurdle to overcome is whether I can make my co-host titter. And... Um, I'm running out of names, so this is potentially going to be a short list. Uh, so. Titter actually is the uh, nickname for the Cobra Mamba, the same <laughs> way that Trouble Bubble. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> what? Where is this coming from? <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just, trying to, just trying to tell a joke. Okay, right. Okay, microphones on, straight faces, ready to go. Okay. <clears throat> Fatal Fluffy. <laughs> Uh. One, of, for, one for one. For, the, for those of you who don't know, Fatal Fluffy's uh, is that that's the, that's the second miniseries. Is that the third miniseries? Your guess will be better than mine. Uh, second miniseries. Oh no, I think that's the Pyramid of Darkness because that's because uh, that's where the Joes have the space station. That, anyway, that rings about. Zartan and the Dreadnoughts are in space, and they have these Ewoks that grow up into dark gray wampas, and they take the Joes <laughs> captive. It's great. Yes, so uh, that means that I've not used up my whole list, and potentially there is one last piece of, uh, of juice to be squeezed out of the Inuenjo lemon. Well, you know, a year from now, there are all these new Joes. Yeah, yeah. With new code names. Uh, well, Sorry, I've... you were saying. <laughs> no, I was getting to the end. Um, I think that you know that's that's us done for for talking about this issue and uh, the various bits. Um, next time uh, we will be uh, covering more from Devil's Due. We're talking about the Frontline series. We've got a episode covering the first Larry Hammer arc, and then we're back for the second arc um, up in some snowy place uh, written by dan jolly uh featuring uh, a very different kind of geo joe story so it'll be interesting to talk about that one uh, and then back here we will be covering the latest issue of geo joe when it comes out and that will be issue 286 which is due for release some point in september um where can people find you tim well in person at my store, Hub Comics, in Union Square, Somerville, which is right next to Cambridge and Boston, Massachusetts, and uh, hubcomics.com, and also Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and YouTube. Hub Comics! Your local comic store. Hub Comics! 
Somerville near Boston. Check out hubcomics.com for details. Uh, and then for G.I. Joe stuff, a realamericanbook.com. Excellent. You can find us on all of the usual places. Talkingjoe.co.uk is the website that has all of those places. We have got Talking Joe, a G.I. Joe podcast on Facebook. Talking Joe on Twitter, Talking Joe Comics on Instagram, and Talking Joe Comics at Gmail on the emails. Uh, we're also on Patreon, so a big thanks to all of our backers Richard, Sam, Jay, Bill, Christopher, and Justin, who are getting early access to episodes as well as some exclusive content. And that's us done. But remember, Nobody beats Talking Joe, a real American podcast! With a guy from England. Laters, potatoes. Um. Yeah. <laughs>